Bronxnet. Your voice, your views, your vision. So whether it's inside a local branch or out in the community, we want to invest in the Bronx. That's why we're, we're proud to be here today, to be part of this panel. Thank the borough president for making this happen. Now let's get started. I want to introduce probably the most important person, most impressive person in the room, at least in my mind, um, Catherine Wild. She's president and CEO of Partnership of New York City, a nonprofit organization dedicated to working with government, labor, and non-for-profit sectors to build a stronger New York with a focus on education, infrastructure, and economy. Ready for this? Catherine, with the partnership of New York City since 1982, Catherine served on 14 years as the founding president and CEO of the Housing Partnership Development Corp. In that capacity, she was instrumental in the creation of a number of pioneering initiatives in affordable housing at the local, state, and national levels. Under her leadership, more than $2 billion, that's $2 billion in private funds were invested in public and private partnerships produced affordable housing and commercial developments in New York's most economically distressed communities. There's more. In 1996, Catherine became the founding president and CEO of the New York City Investment Fund, the Partnership Economic Development Arm. $120 million civic investment fund has helped to diversify the city's economy, create thousands of jobs, and promote entrepreneurial business initiatives across the five boroughs. Catherine also serves on numerous boards and advisory groups here in New York has authored numerous articles and policy papers, and has been recognized for her leadership by dozens of educational, professional, and nonprofit organizations. Wow, I'm exhausted just reading it. I don't know how you could possibly do it all. So please give me a warm welcome for Catherine Wilde. Catherine? Rob Walsh, who's our New York City Commissioner of Small Business Services, who's done a great job for the last eight years in really creating a small business focus in the city administration. And John Shapiro, who is a uh, planning and development consultant, uh, who's done uh, a lot of work in the Bronx as well. Nice to see you guys. Um, I'll just open with a, with a couple uh, general remarks and then uh, turn to the panel we'll each make some remarks and then hopefully move to discussion with all of you because I'm sure the topic of uh, retention and expansion of business is both a complex one and a controversial one. Um, I would start by saying um, one of, the, one of the lessons I think it's important to remember in economic development was something that Jane Jacobs said kind of at the end of her career. And she said, when you're doing it, trying to do economic development, the key is to go with market forces, not to try to fight them. And I think that's something we have to remember when we're balancing our uh, sympathetic concerns about retention of business and our forward-looking thoughts about how we grow an economy. The, when I went to, uh, to work at uh, the New York City Investment Fund, which uh, in 1996, the first project I was asked to look at was one that the borough president mentioned this morning, Farberware. And uh, the city and state came to the investment fund and said, could you put some money into saving Farberware? So we went out to the plant, we put a team together of uh, professionals in the, uh, among other things, the head of all clad flew in from uh, 
Pennsylvania, um, a, number of, a number of other manufacturing experts to go up and look at what was a very decrepit plant in, uh, just really in Longwood, really, I think. Um, and um, found out that the biggest customer of Farberware was uh, Macy's, Federated Department Stores at the time. And we said, you know, they're 50 blocks south, biggest customer, we ought to have some influence here on the future of Farberware. So we went, we called, up, and, and Federated was one of the investors in our fund, they were one of our members. So we called, I called up the president of Federated, and I said, do you think you could help us save, at that point it was 400 manufacturing jobs in the South Bronx, keep Farberware there. And I said, the, the guy, a guy in Hong Kong, has uh, bought the factory name, the name Farberware, but it's going to close the factory and move production. Um, at that point, I think it was to Korea. So, is that somebody's cell phone? Um, so I called the guy up and he said, well, I know the guy who's buying the factory in Hong Kong, I'll call him and I'll find out what the deal is. So he called up this guy in Hong Kong and called me back and said, here's what Sidney Shang reports to me. He said, this hasn't been a business for 30 years. Uh, the name Farberware has some cachet with blue-haired ladies. So the name is handy to put on um, pots and pans uh, for sale in, uh, around the country. But in point of fact, the business has not been profitable. Uh, the, it was saved in 1981 when Hugh Carey uh, had the state buy the building that Farberware was in and lease it back to them for a dollar a year. Then the city got them a UDAG grant, they got tax abatement. And so for 20 odd years, Farberware was kept alive by city and state taxpayers. 400 jobs were saved during that time. Maybe money should have been invested in retraining those people for a manufacturing, uh, for an advanced manufacturing economy for technology jobs. And I think it's an example because, uh, and again, I mentioned it because the borough president raised it, it's an example of where our emotions, his first job, um, may interfere with our judgment about what we ought to be doing going forward. Um, on a more positive note, the Bronx has enormous assets. I was interested to read that in terms of job growth in the last five years, the job growth has been in the insurance industry where your jobs have doubled. I don't know how many of you knew that. But that's kind of a, an interesting factor because I think most of us don't think insurance Bronx. Um, the question is how the Bronx is going to be branded going forward. Obviously, the healthcare and educational institutions that you have here are phenomenal. You've got Montefiore leading really leading the country in healthcare IT, which is the big new job generating area. You have uh, Einstein, which is one of the top institutions in terms of life science and research and development in the country. So you've got much at Fordham University, obviously, which is a top notch uh, educational institution. Um, the partnerships between universities and the next generation of business are really important. Job creation does not so much come from small business, but from new business. New business is a function of the innovation coming out of universities and research institutions. The Bronx has that asset and has an opportunity to capitalize on it. And I think that's an important topic for discussion today, and I'll be interested to hear what our other panelists have to say about that. Um, then finally, I guess I'd say, and, and this may be controversial too, um, I was involved in the Bronx in residential redevelopment. We were frustrated in, in that was a neighborhood revitalization effort. And residential and retail development really are important tools for neighborhood revitalization. But they are not the key to economic development. You have to go beyond residential and retail. And I think that that's another, been another distraction in the Bronx. A lot of the energy and focus has gone into projects that may provide some short term, some jobs, but don't really see the future of a growth economy and brand the Bronx in a way that focuses on new areas. And I think you have to today, hopefully, pick a couple of industry cluster areas where you're really going to focus on hopefully um, in conjunction with your research and university centers and 
use those as the focus of attention to try and brand the Bronx in a new way. So that's my unsolicited Brooklyn-based outside. Um, <laughs> the other thing I was thinking about was that anecdotally I'm from Brooklyn, and I remember when Smith Street was a decrepit couple of Bronx blocks with a couple of good restaurants. Today, it's like a five-mile square corridor that is a destination for um, tourists, day trippers, and, and everybody else. Manhattanites coming to Brooklyn for dinner. Arthur Avenue is still the same couple of blocks that it's been for 30 years. And I was wondering myself, why is that? Why hasn't that grown and had a multiplier effect? Because it's got as great a restaurant as we have any place in Brooklyn. So that is just another observation in terms of maybe some of the challenges of, to the Bronx. And um, I was asked to do a, a lesson from Brooklyn, so that was it. <laughs> OK, let me, let me turn now. And I'm not sure if we have a particular, if you guys have a particular order. But I guess, um, why don't we, on, the, on this page, it's Joan. So do you want to start and make a few remarks? And then we'll get the conversation started. Thank you. Sure. And um, maybe maybe this is a good slot for me because I want to respond to some of what you said about manufacturing. I'm um, not Adam Friedman. Uh, Adam um, became in June the third executive director of the Pratt Center for Community Development, where I work. Um, we, you know, I have the privilege of working with some of the most creative and amazing community-based organizations on the planet, all of whom happen to be located in the Bronx. Um, so I, I got to fill in. Um, Niren, Adam's former gig in the New York Industrial Retention Network, some of you may know, was in the business of not bucking the tide of the market, not trying to save the barberwares of the world, or today the Stelladoros, but trying to find the sweet spot that the, the, the big shrinkage of the manufacturing sector, a lot of us believe, has largely run its course. And Kathy and everybody else who says this is, you know, is certainly right that New York doesn't make sense to be located if you make a commodity, if you make something that can be manufactured by any workforce, any place, and shipped any place. If New York is too expensive a town for you, and you're, you're not going to find a competitive advantage here. Who's left in the manufacturing sector here? And it's substantial. There are 100,000 people, in, there are 100,000 manufacturing jobs still in New York City, and many more in quasi-manufacturing and other blue-collar sectors, so transportation, wholesaling, logistics, et cetera, et cetera. And those are important jobs for a lot of reasons. They're a great match for the fastest growing part of our workforce. Something like 80% of the blue-collar workforce are people of color, and 75% are immigrants. And those jobs, many of which don't even require a high school diploma, traditionally have been a ticket into the middle class if you don't have a college degree or some college, or I guess in this economy if you don't have an MBA. So um, not to, the purchasing power that comes with those living wages is a huge multiplier in the economy. So it isn't a sector that we can afford to just say, you know, that's, you know, that's so 20th century, we're, you know, we're over manufacturing. Um, the firms that are still here, you probably know better. I mean, who am I, a planner, like talking to a room full of business people? So I'll, I'll, I'll pause for a second. Who here has either a company or, a, or an organization that has operations in the Bronx? Just raise your hand. And who's in, who's, who's in healthcare? Okay. Uh, who's in education? And who's in, um, Finance, business services, real estate, etc. Okay, who's in manufacturing? Okay, the few, the proud. <laughs> yeah, there's there is a huge amount to talk about, and so I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you exactly what you make and who you sell it to. But what Nyan has found, what we found in kind of surveying the state of the field, is the manufacturing firms that are here and growing are ones that are a lot trading within the metropolitan area. They buy services that they need, like design, 
within the within the region, and most important, they sell their products to people who need them within the region, and they are in industries where it's vitally important to them to be close to both of those markets, the pool of resources and talents they buy from, and especially the folks that they sell to. And those folks can't make it if they move to South Carolina or Asia, and they probably can't even make it if they move to Jersey. So what does it take for them to stay here and thrive? I mean, how many people, no matter what your sector, find the cost of space to be a major barrier to expansion or to just hang on? Yeah. Okay. And uh, aligned with that, how about the transportation or the lack thereof? Okay. How, many, how many people have to get their employees to the job site in a car service every day? Okay. Or, or most days? Um, and some of, the, some of the other challenges that have to be overcome, those are big ones. Um, street space, um, goods movement, for how many people is that a problem? Okay. Yeah. Somebody talked about parking in New York. I mean, streets are a precious form of real estate, and the joke about real estate is they're not making any more of it. So a market solution to that problem, or a variety of market solutions to that problem, are of interest to all New Yorkers, no matter what sector we work in, but of really special interest if you've got a truckload of fresh croissants that really has to get where it's going before they go stale. So I think it's, it'll be interesting to talk about some of the, the strategies that have been used other places to free up street space, not only, not only for folks driving their cars to get from A to B, but for trucks that have really got to get from A to B. And some of that is by maybe considering does everything we move need to move by a truck. Um, so I think those, those are some of the challenges. Some of the things the city can do to alleviate those challenges. Um, if Kathy's right, the city's economic development strategy, a lot of us feel, has been too focused not only on retail, but on real estate development for retail or for whatever is the highest and best use in a way that maybe doesn't any longer serve us well. But focusing on real estate is kind of like the goose that laid the golden eggs. Like, let's kill the goose and get the eggs now, and you won't have eggs tomorrow if you do that. So the concept of the highest and best use in real estate is very harsh on startups, on small businesses, on the creative sector, on manufacturers, on anybody who can't afford to pay top dollar for space. So our zoning policies have been pretty inimical to those users that we have lost about a quarter of our manufacturing space. We have 25,000 acres citywide of land zoned for manufacturing in 2002. Okay, so not a long time ago, seven years ago. And that was the basis of the argument that the Bloomberg administration has made to say, Geez, that's way too much. You know, like this, this soup no longer fits us. We lost weight. Let's get rid of it. So, but of that 25,000 acres, in fact, 11,000 of that was actually not being used by manufacturing or even by manufacturing, quasi manufacturing or industrial firms. It was being used as sewage treatment plants. It was being used as rail yards. It was being used by big con effluents. It was being used by users who weren't going to release it into the market in the foreseeable future, it was effectively not in contention for use by even manufacturing or other kinds of businesses that need that space. So really at that time, uh, we, you know, we only had 14,000 acres, and we have since lost either through deliberate rezoning or through the incursion of non-conforming, non-manufacturing uses 3,500 of those acres. So, something like, we're, we're now down to like, you know, 43% of what we believed we had in 2002. So maybe it's time to go off this kind of Atkins diet and think about a different approach to land use. Um, so there's a saying, you know, the, the atheist who's, you know, the, the hiker atheist who's running through the forest with bears chasing after him, you know, finally comes to Jesus and says, God, if you don't help me, at least don't help the bear. So let's, let's look <laughs> at policies that maybe we need to move away from and stop helping the bear. So let me, let me let it go to some of the other panelists there, and then maybe as we get around, we can talk about what some of those other policies might be that need changing. Thanks, Jill, that's great. Um, Yuria, you want to go next? I can jump in, sure. <laughs> 
Hi, um, I'm Deirdre Sutton, and I'm with the Bronx Council on the Arts. I'm the managing director. Thank you. That's important to the audience. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, what the Bronx Council is. I think we're right now. Um, cultural economic development, which um, often puts a twist um, on the topic that we're discussing. Um, the Bronx Council is um, really envisions communities where local artists and cultural workers help to spur economic development um, in the round. And we're looking forward to helping to develop a community. Can everybody hear me with or without the mic? Okay, cool, because it's a little distracting. Um, basically, um, we want to um, help to develop a community where the arts and culture are naturally considered part of the key industries that are discussed. Oftentimes, um, when I go out to different um, panels such as this or conferences, and they talk about economic development strategies and activities, the arts and culture are not included in the broad discussion. And um, one of the things that we would like to foster is a recognition of the arts and artists, and designers, etc., as key to a holistic approach and um, critical to the economic ecology, especially here in the Bronx and in New York. Um, this is really an asset-based approach to economic um, and community development. And we're looking to leverage existing strengths um, to achieve the multiplier effect um, that everybody is talking about. Um, one of the things that we see as positive aspects is that um, this multiplier effect and being able to link the creative um, community with the broader economy is that it helps to mitigate displacement and it also helps to mitigate the loss of um, you know, economic infrastructures in the communities. And some of the strategies that we've been using um, to look at that or chip away at the, pro at the um, problem, so to speak, is we have a series of well-rounded programs that um, really look to expand not only individual artists but also seek to buttress um, arts organizations, other cultural nonprofits, and also support um, the retail community and the general community at large. So we're really seeking to create a, a broad mix. Um, we seek also to enhance the profile of Bronx Arts. And so we have programs such as um, the Bronx Indie Artist Series, where we're working with independent artists who really are on the cusp of breaking into the field, often doing um, cutting edge work, and we work with venues to get them major um, exposure opportunities and also um, you know, other types of opportunities such as publishing for writers, dance for dancers, of course, and um, other types of performance-based activities. Moving forward, some of what we're um, looking forward to doing is enhancing and being more aggressive around um, workforce development and the, and the creative economy. Um, we have some specific examples that really have reached a lot of um, success over the years. And um, one of the key programs that we're working with right now is uh, the Fine Art Handlers Training Program. And um, actually, um, this is becoming a model um, we are supported, um, supported by some of our colleagues in the room in terms of doing that, such as um, the SBA and the SBS. And um, I find that this is really wonderful in um, helping to support and recognize that there is economic viability in terms of creating and fostering this mix. And through that program, it started out by working with people who were underemployed, um, unemployed, and marginally employed and training them into what is really a $6 billion, that's with a B, um, industry um, that is the back office um, aspect of um, the arts and culture, uh, writ large. So let's look at affiliated areas such as, again, design, manufacturing, and that really skirts also the retail sector because, for example, um, many of the things you might see like in an IKEA store um, a pottery barn, 
um, you know, I can't name a lot of the retailers. I'm too busy to shop. But um, <laughs> we could um, create partnerships, and we're looking forward to creating partnerships where we can um, really work to manufacture and create um, retail possibilities for the fine artists that are here and designers, et cetera. We're doing that um, through launching a multi-pronged approach where we're working directly um, with artists, designers, again, people in the arts community and also um, indigenous creators. People, we have a very diverse borough and this goes back um, to tapping into the assets that are right here in the community. We have folks that have come and hail from numerous different nations, and each of them brings with them their own unique uh, creative aspect, for example. So we have lace makers in the Bronx, and um, folks that when you go into, you know, Lord and Taylor or Bergdorf's, you're actually looking at a one-off of what they're making. And so I'm trying to develop ways that we can create um, not only a workforce, but a creative force that is able to um, contribute and compete openly in that type of marketplace. Um, some of how we do do uh, those things is uh, through strategic partnerships, of course. So going back to the Art Handlers Program, we have a wonderful partnership with Transcon, which is one of the largest um, fine art shipping companies in the world, actually, which is also right here in the Bronx. And um, we have a full curriculum, which is a certified training program for the fine art handlers. And they can work with um, anyone from museums to auction houses. And uh, right now we have one of our um, trainees who's supervising or was supervising a aspects of the Madoff auction. And so um, these are quite high paying jobs. They generally begin in the 15 to $25 an hour range. And so they're definitely paying a livable wage, and uh, not just a minimal, minimal wage, but a living wage, something that allows people to subsist and to progress in their life. And um, also, that goes back into the holistic approach where we're doing things to also try to enhance the life skills, the financial um, literacy of the arts community. And um, that also um, speaks to the financial literacy of nonprofit organizations. And also the way we think about and approach nonprofits. One of the things that I believe and also we're trying to foster through the council is that Nonprofits are businesses. They do everything that your commercial or retail business would do. And um, we've been working to try to um, inculcate that into <laughs> the general conversation because we're not a one-off. Um, basically, the cultural nonprofits specific to BCA contribute to the greater whole as any other business. And so we're trying to get not only um, the recognition, and again, going back to key areas and also being level with the rest of business enterprise. We'll come back to more topics um, when uh, we get to general discussion, but that's my intro. Thank you. Great, thanks. Rob, you want to go? A few of us is trying to make our links to the Bronx. I, I, will, I will do mine. I spent uh, six years across the street at Fordham University, and it's where I realized uh, one morning that I needed glasses run, when running through the Botanical Garden one morning. Um, I was feeling good, class was over, we were on break, and I decided to go up and pet a skunk. <laughs> True story. Uh, the white tail went up, he hissed, I backed away, didn't get sprayed, but um, a half hour later, I showered and made my way to Fordham Road and picked up one of those really geeky 1981 type glasses. You remember the ones, you know, the, the big? Um, so uh, that's my connections back to the, every time I, I'm back in the botanical garden, I'm looking for that skunk again. But I got my contacts in. Um, here's what I want to talk about. You know, I look around the room here and I see so many wonderful people that are, you know, uh, on the front line who are doing so much work, and I want to take a, a credit for John's work mm -hmm. and uh, Carrie's work and the, you know, Fordham Road Bid and Southern Boulevard and uh, Ray, and, and that's our bread and butter, and quite frankly, that's my bread and butter. I, I headed up a business improvement district at Union Square for 
eight years. I love going out into communities and walking and talking and hearing about you know the 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 day-to-day -day issues that face you know many communities. Last Friday, I was out Myrtle Avenue and. Bed Stuy in, the, um, in Brooklyn, you know, just walking with a new business improvement district that was created. And what does that mean? It means merchants and small businesses getting together and trying to, you know, deal with some of the problems that that, that people face, you know, day in and day out. And we have, you know, certainly grown that program here in the Bronx, where we have eight business improvement districts. The man standing in the back, a lot of that has to do with Ray and 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 him guiding us and helping us. We'll have a new business improvement district soon. You know, and I, I've mentioned you know so many of the others. I saw Carrie uh, Goodman, who is here today, who's done a, done a, done an amazing job. Any baseball fans here? Anybody? You know, I was telling I was telling him I cried the day that uh, Orlando Cepeda was traded to the St. Louis Cardinals from the Giants. I grew up a Giants fan, and um, he uh, Carrie had Orlando Cepeda back, a Hall of Famer, you know, for for an event. And I was sorry to miss it, but he's done a remarkable job, and that's what it's all about. And sometimes it's hard to hear what we have to hear, John, right? I mean, in terms of some of the things that we face, but it, you know, we, we have to, we're on the front line and we look to do what, uh, uh, you know, on my end of what we could help. Uh, later this afternoon, Jeremy Waldrop will be with us talking more about the commercial revitalization. Um, I probably have just stolen his thunder because he does work with groups like yours and so many others. In, in the minutes that I have left, I want to talk about you know, what's on my mind quite a bit, and that's business services. And what do we do um, in providing business services, not only to the small businesses, but also to the merchants associations, the chamber of commerce, the business improvement districts, and so many of the others. And Kathy was right, you know, um, and, and thank you. Um, uh, we had work to do in terms of building out our suite of services uh, when we came in in, in 2002. Uh, it's hard to believe we did not have a Department of Small Business Services until Mike Bloomberg came into office. Uh, we have built that out, and I will tell you, we still have a lot of work to do in building it out. Uh, one of the first things we did was we partnered up, and one of the organizations we partnered up is an organization that's very active here in the Bronx, and that's Grant Associates. And I see D Diane Edelston with us from Grant Associates. And what we said is we're going to open up we're going to put our shingle out on the street, and we're going to open up business centers throughout the five boroughs. Now, the difference of opening up a center, uh, let's say in 2003, four, you know, when we when we did it, and say years ago, is we have uh, the advantage of 311. We have the advantage of a network of organizations, and, and certainly a lot of small businesses here are doing their work on the web, and getting information on NYC.gov and 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 our our website and so many others. So that, that was our advantage. And then the second thing was to build it out and make sure that we're providing services. Now, it's of no cost, you know, and I've seen it time and time again in terms of how many you know, businesses, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna cite numbers for you, but if it's, a, if it's an education for some of the new businesses here, this is great, and I, I wanna get the word out. Uh, free business courses, free business plans, in some cases, you know, we'll have a small business or an entrepreneur that will come to us saying, I, I want to open up in the Bronx. And we'll work with them on a business plan and, and say, look, hold it off because you don't have enough money for your inventory and, and other things and, and, and continue to work with them. What uh, Kathy and I were talking about, you know, earlier today is, is what we're spending a lot more time, quite frankly, is, is financial assistance. Where's the money? Uh, where's the capital? You know, I, I want to open up or I want to expand or I, or I just want to stay afloat. Um, you know, some of the banks have, uh, have tightened up on their credit. We've all read about it. We, we know it. And what we have done has been more aggressive, not only with the banks, but also with the credit unions and other financial organizations like CITCO and Axion to go that extra mile when someone does have a good idea to sharpen their business plan and, 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 and get, and, and, and get a, a, a good idea before um, uh, uh, the people who are financing that. And Diane could probably give you uh, a laundry list of, of, of things that have taken place uh, from gourmet coffee shops to apparel shops to uh, uh, mom and pop shops throughout the five boroughs and she's done a tremendous job. Um, going forward, we still have a lot of work to do on government navigation. We know that, we've heard that. 
I, I, I've, you know, I look around this room and I, you know, I, I think of conversations that I've had with a number of people here about how difficult it is to do business with the city. And you know, why can't it be? And one of the projects that is on top of my list that I've been banging away at and we're making some headway on that is something called Business Express. And if you don't know about the website, this is another thing that you know, perhaps I could provide. Take a look at it uh, for me if you can, because it, we're still building it out. It's nyc.gov slash business express. If you could do your banking on, online, why can't you open a store online? Uh, why, you know, and, and we've been chipping away. You know, getting this information online and then eliminating the duplicative steps that, 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 that people have. And I've heard, you know, dissertations on this. You know, I'm providing the same information to buildings as I am to fire, to landmarks, to consumer affairs. I had one restaurant owner told me, he showed me a list of, of, of the 50 permits that he had to uh, file. 50! From 18 different agencies, you know, to get open. And, um, you know, we, we are going to be investing, uh, and this is where I don't want to steal the mayor's thunder because then I'll really lose my job. Um, uh, we're investing a lot of effort in this. And just as we did with 311, we're convinced that we can make this thing happen over the next four years of bringing this all together where you can end up actually doing business online. I'll give you the example of consumer affairs where everything used to have to be done on waiting online at 42 Broadway, right? We've all been there, right? Or hiring an expediter to do that to go from place to place. They've, they've gotten 24 of their 35 permits online. It's not enough. It's not enough. And, um, you know, uh, and we just got to get more and more where you could end up doing business. It, it saves you time. It saves you money. It, it eliminates some of the aggravation that you hear. And I think that's one of the, uh, you know, the big pushes. The other big push is what we heard from the borough president today, is about jobs. Uh, it's not only about the creation of jobs, but it's also linking to New Yorkers to jobs um, that are here, um, not only in the Bronx, but throughout the five boroughs. Uh, we have opened up two successful uh, workforce centers, one on 149th Street, another on Southern Boulevard. We're not done yet. Um, going up and meeting with the new uh, uh, president of uh, uh, Hostess, Hostess Community College. Did I say it right? Hostos. Hostos, okay. Uh, you, get, you see where my Spanish is, right? Um, uh, new energetic uh, president. Uh, uh, and, you know, and my hope is that we can end up making even more links with our community colleges that are right here on, on workforce uh, development. You know, we proudly boast the fact that we've taken, you know, when there used to be an agency called Department of Employment uh, that was consolidated with small business services. At the time, they were placing 500 New Yorkers in jobs, and, and, and they were proud of it. Last year, we placed 17,000. This year, we'll place over 22,000. Now, many of you are thinking, that's great, but what are the wages of the, those jobs? Well, you know what? You've got to start somewhere, and many of them are, you know, were below, you know, living wage, and, and many of them were start in, in retail. And what we're now moving is into more sector center based training and development. You know, Diane could tell you because Grant is also out in, in Queens. We made a relationship recently with the airports and all those organizations around the airports at, at, in Southeast Queens. What, what, what is the average wage? About $13, $14 an hour? Not just entry level, but middle management. And the, you know, the, and the question, and I think the challenge for us, I don't have all the answers, is how do you end up doing that in, Bron in, in the Bronx? We have the Hunts Point Market. We have four institutions that are joining themselves right here. One of them, Botanical Gardens. Botanical Gardens is now talking to Fordham University again, thank God, right? Remember that, yeah. right? Uh, Montefiore and Zoological Society. Take those four campuses. You know, on acres, you could put a cattle ranch together, but we're not gonna do a cattle ranch, but you think about the growth and the development, and what I'm seeing of the institutions is them looking outside their doors. Crime is at an all-time low, you know, let, let's hope. And people are thinking about how can we end up growing and developing, you know, to make that happen. I saw Darth in the room before. Uh, there he is. You know, he's one of the engineers in terms of encouraging people to make that happen. And that's exactly what's been, you know, taking place. Not a takeover of the neighborhood, but how do we blend and how do we create and how do we offer jobs and how do we make things like that happen? And I think that's another thing that comes out of a summit like that is that blend between physical development, 
um, the institutions that are here, and then the opportunities that we could we could we could create for people who live here. And I and I and you know the good news is we've made some progress. Um, the the realization is we still have a lot of work to do on all the fronts. We have a lot of work to do on the on the business services side, on on helping you know connect the businesses with with government, and also um, you know certainly on the workforce. I'll stop because I don't want to uh, hog everybody else's time. But thank you very much for listening to me. Thanks. So, John, your uh, cleanup, and then we'll turn to the audience for some comments and questions. Uh, I'm an odd person to be asked to talk about beautification because, in fact, I've spent most of my career as a planner doing market studies and feasibility studies and area redevelopment studies. And I think that may be part of why I was asked. Um, I think you need to use the mic. Oh, okay, sure. How many people are here are actually merchants? And how many are here are advocates for a business district, one place or another? Okay. And how many of you shop? <laughs> okay. So, you know, a lot of this is going to be common sense, and I'm going to draw upon that as I talk about. Suppose I came here in jeans and a torn teen shirt, and I mumbled my way through things. That would work if you had no choice but to sit here, and perhaps right now you do, so I have no choice, but I'm going to go on. Um, the retail equivalent is the corner bodega. No one goes to a bodega expecting cheap prices sold in a handsome way. We go for the convenience and the bodega owner knows it, and as often as not takes the shopper for granted in how they display their merchandise and their business. In retail in general, and in particular, when there's a shrinking uh, spending power in the community due to unemployment and, and downward uh, economics, uh, business districts do not have the luxury of taking their customer for granted. So I'm not talking about beautification, <laughs> I'm talking about smart business. You dress for the customer you want, just like in theory, you dress for the job you want. And I don't want to be a butler. Um, it's, it's about merchandising. Procter & Gamble changes their advertising and package, packaging as the customer tastes change, and each business district should change its appearance and image in the same way. Now, there's a lot to choose from. There's storefronts, signage, awnings, the building, benches, street furniture, plantings, landscaping, lighting, design themes. Uh, special event flourishes, seasonal flourishes, wider sidewalks, smooth sidewalks, brick sidewalks, bicycle racks, tandem parking, shared parking, parking lot landscaping, graffiti removal, you can keep going, right? And you don't have to do it all. Though remember we travel to Europe to go to places that do do it all. So if you, can't, if you have that luxury, by all means do it all, but most of us don't. You need to do only those physical improvements that have a market impact, even if it's incremental, and it starts with the customer. Now, what's going on with the Bronx customer since, let's say, 2000? Uh, just a few things. Computer ownership and online shopping is up. People want to socialize now when they shop. So that, works on, that relates to working on a sense of place. Uh, feature the library, the church, the daycare center, the public school. These are now as much anchors for your shopping district as the supermarket. Uh, public place for events, flea markets, farmer markets. Um, a part of this strategy too, as is all the cultural things that you talked about in terms of creating a memorable place. And it's only memorable and sustainable as a memorable place if it's authentic. This is not about copycatting what the next guy did down the shopping district. The uh, Bronx population is young. 30% of the population is enrolled in school. And as of how many people have had teenagers <laughs> you know, you know, and young adults, they shop. And don't be shy about competing for the dollars. When the Pratt Center looked at Fulton Street in downtown Brooklyn, they found that over 50% of the shoppers were, in their, were teens and in their 20s. Um, they liked Fulton Street. They liked the, all that cacophony. Um, the city efforts for traditional historic preservation, in this case, does a disservice to the businesses. Brash is better. Uh, it's more memorable. Uh, foreign immigration. Um, more than half of the population of the Bronx speaks a foreign language at home. But it's not a homogeneous ethnic population. For example, 10% of the Bronx is now from Africa. It's first generation from Africa. And this provides the opportunity for ethnic shopping that has crossover appeal to a wider population. Think Arthur Avenue, 
but for all the ethnicities of the Bronx. And as, while we're talking about Arthur Avenue, my first downtown revitalization study was Smith Street. And the, there was a large amount of unmet demand from the yuppies who were gentrifying the neighborhood. So in their case, putting in the street lighting and creating safer sidewalks was part of the re-imaging of Smith Street to appeal to a new market, who wasn't ultimately for its own sake. Now here's an odd one. Public transit usage has increased by roughly 10% in the, in the Bronx. And my guess is this has to do with bus use due to the single fare. So consider what you could do at each bus stop to invite shoppers to your shopping street. It could be something like a kiosk, um, an outdoor cafe, an easier way to cross the street so you can go to the, across the street to the shops across the way. The over 65 population is increasing very, very much in the North Bronx. Um, seniors place a higher than usual priority on service and once their patronage is secured, they stick with the store. So how can the district be of service in this? Benches, shade, smooth sidewalks, very, very basic and very important for seniors, easy to cross streets, people watching, things that read stay a while. So in comparison to the youth where brash and image and you know, travel that extra 15, 20 minutes to get to a place, memorable is less important to seniors than comfort and familiarity. So in their case, for example, historic preservation makes a lot of sense. Um, these are some transient factors that start with knowing the customer. There's some abiding market realities. The first is foot traffic. Uh, Mike Byrne um, is a retail specialist. And I uh, called him up for this and asked him, well, what is a typical, based on foot traffic, 1,000 people walking by your store, what type of gross do you get per 1,000 people? $50. $5 rent. So a typical uh, healthy shopping district gets about 10,000 pedestrians walking by. That's $500 gross per square foot, $50 uh, per square foot rent. If you increase the amount of foot traffic, you're increasing the gross sales. It's that simple. So people avoid shopping districts where they're crowded off the street. That was what 8th Street faced, for example, and they widened their sidewalks to re-attract the shoppers. 50% uh, of the residents said they never go down 8th Street because they're just bumped into the traffic before. Fixing up under the L, for example, would be another priority. Ever cross Queens Boulevard to go shopping on both sides or even Broadway on the Upper West Side? Not much, but you will for Madison Avenue. So traffic calming, all those things in the DOT manual done by Andy Wiley Schwartz who's now teaching at Pratt, those are examples of things that can be done to make it easier for people to go back and forth and shop, you know, go down one side of the street, cross over, walk over the other side of the street. Um, Ever avoid going to a shopping district because you can't find a parking space within sight of the front entrance of the store? According to the Urban Land Institute, people work hard to park within 400 feet of the store entrance. It's not possible, really, in New York City. But according to traffic experts, that 400 feet becomes 1,200 feet if it's a pleasant walk. Let's say down a tree-lined street with some storefronts and you're having a nice time, you'll walk three times as far. I mean, just think about L.L. Bean, for those of you who shop there, you don't really mind parking in that, in that sea of parking because it's a very attractive experience with lots of things for you to see and tree-lined portions for you to walk along. Another body principle is grabbing the shopper's attention. The standard answer is a lot of signs, lots of signs, lots and lots of signs, um, with the word sale plastered over them. And filling out the entire window in the case of supermarkets and a lot of other stores and a sandwich block that, which you trip over them. Um, ever drive down Central Avenue? Um, you see too many signs for too many businesses to digest any, to take in any one sign. And that's the result. So there's better ways to attract the attention of the would-be shopper. Norman Mintz, the founder of the Main Street Management Movement, another professor of Pratt, uh, likes to make the building's use of colors and awnings an extension of the, of the store's image so that when you're across the street, you see the building, it looks upclass, or it looks neon, or it looks um, funky, and you know immediately what that store is going to be, even though you can't necessarily look at the window from across the street. You light the sidewalks up more than the street. Whatever's brighter gets more attention. That's the whole reason for pedestrian-scaled lighting and for what's called ambient lighting, which is gooseneck lights on the building, for example, or, or see-through um, uh, screens, uh, gates for the store. So the light from the store goes out on the sidewalk. So when you're driving by or walking, you feel safe because the part that's most lit is the part where the pedestrians are. Actually, the one I like the most is up to the merchants alone. Clear out the windows of paper and anything that blocks the view into the store and brightly light the interior. 
Pedestrians typically pass a New York City storefront store in seven seconds. If they, like, if they don't like what they see, they hurry or pass, I say six seconds. If they like what they see, they may even stop and the average goes down to nine seconds. Um, that's getting a 30% increase in consumer recognition of that store's product. Another favorite is sign colors and words. I asked Norman Mintz once, uh, what would he put in a sign ordinance that worked for the merchant, not for the aesthete? And he said, light lettering on a dark background. Uh, try it out sometime. Uh, same size sheet of paper, uh, black, let's say, with white lettering, white with black lettering, hold it 15 feet away and see which one you can read better. Now, uh, the real truth about this tux is I actually have a new job. I'm, I'm the, uh, if you didn't hear the plugs for Pratt, I'm uh, now chair of the Graduate Center for Planning and Environment at Pratt Institute. And I, in fact, have to go to a gala tonight. Uh, thank you. And I actually have to go to a gala tonight with the president, and I don't have any time <laughs> to get home and change. <laughs> um, but we, we, we thought you were working lunch. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, my next job. <laughs> Um, but perhaps you're more likely to remember me because of the tux. <laughs> and it's really the same thing for the consumer. A consumer is going to remember the shopping district based on the image that shopping district presents. And it should be, that image should be, speak exactly to the consumer as opposed to, let's say, abstractions. Thanks, John. Okay, questions from the audience, comments? Someone has to start. Yes. I think you should start. I live two mi I live in the Northeast Bronx, and I live two miles from my local post office. So if I miss, which is really unusual for people who live in other areas where your post office is a couple of blocks away, so. If I miss the mail person who need to go pick up a package, I have to travel two miles to Westchester Square. So I usually ride my bike because that's my preferred mode of travel, unlike many of my neighbors in the Bronx. And um, the other thing is Westchester Square is an area that's just, I think in many ways, ripe for development. I shop there often when I find things that I need. Uh, and this area is one that I think I mean, I, have, I don't spend a lot of time there because I usually don't go to the post office and it's out of my way, but I go there often enough that I would like to shop there more. And the only development I know in that area over the last years was uh, a new housing development that was built there by a private developer. The units were not able to be sold or rented and were turned into housing for homeless families. And so, it's just a neighborhood, it's one of many neighborhoods here that I'd like to see expand and I think a lot could be done. How, how could you leave now? <laughs> oh good, good, right? Come on over. I, I, um, I, the only thing I would say in response to that is New York is understored. It's just a fact. And so it does, there is room for expansion. Westchester Square, we have, we have heard them loud and clear, and I think we're going to hear them loud and clear again. Um, I, have, I, have been up to, I have been up to Westchester Square. How many times have you seen them in the last year? Four, five, I don't know. I've, I've been out. Twice? Yeah. yeah. Okay, twice. Twice is pretty good. I've been up there more than twice. Uh, Owen, what park? Owen Dolan Park, yeah. right? O Owen Dolan Park and a group of the merchants and small businesses have really gotten together and they have banged their pots and pans and letters and phone calls and they have gotten something done and they're moving things. And the, you know, the premise there, um, and there's a gentleman in the back that probably will talk more about this, is to create a special place. And you're right, it is a special you know, place and it does have transportation access, you know, starting with the park looking at some of the zoning around the area to get reinvestment of housing so you have eyes and ears in the park. And Mr. Shapiro could talk more. I'm out of my league when I start talking about you know, planning, but I'm, I'm doing pretty good, right? Oh, no, it's working. Um, and, and starting there and getting that park you know, revived and, and, and programmed. And uh, we have a clean streets program that we're working with them, but there's you know, much more 
and there are people in this room that could talk much more about the uh, uh, efforts that are taking place, and I, I, I think you're going to see uh, so much more coming out of Westchester Square, you know, in the, in the next couple of years, starting with the park. And, and it brings me back to my, you know, um, memories of going up to Union Square uh, in 1989 and, and watching Union Square be the catalyst, uh, a good, clean, safe, programmed Union Square leading to a lot of business and investment and development and playgrounds and a green market and, and housing around it. And, and I think there's a lot of people in this room, one, invested in it, and uh, they're going to be, you know, quite frankly, holding our feet to the fire to make sure that happens. That's a nice en entree to you. Um, I just wanted to also jump in in support of Westchester Square. They absolutely get it and um, should really be looked on as a model for, um, especially from our point of view, for cultural economic development. We've been in a relationship with Westchester Square as well. And um, they are really working very diligently to bring a well-rounded approach, everything from streetscaping to engaging directly um, and on an individual and group level with the local merchants and businesses, community centers, and also the residents. And some of the initiatives um, that have come out of that have um, sprung from um, the park and the Owen Dolan uh, Recreational Center, but also from the actual um, due diligence, and I have to say um, truth-telling that they do in the community. They really engage um, with the merchants and talk about forward planning, but also um, help to educate and bring um, the word, as it were, to the merchants that are in their community so that um, everybody really can get on the same page. And they're really trying to be very inclusive there. Okay. Do I know you? No, I just happened to I just wanted to make that clear. I never saw this lady before in my life, okay? And I, I have to tell you, you made my heart jump today. Thank you. Um, I wanna, I just wanna, I have a question I wanna ask. And before I ask that question, I just wanna mention that I think that the Department of Small Business Services in New York City is probably the best run city agency in New York City. I really believe that. I really believe that. Okay. Um, my biggest problem, and <laughs> Commissioner Wall says, how many times he, he, have I he seen you? He always does this to me. He softens me up. Yeah, and, 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 that's, that's my MO. throw a right hook at <laughs> that's me. Right. No, I'm it. not going to. I'm I not going feel, to. I can feel it. I'm not going to throw a right hook at you. <laughs> because um, and he's big. my biggest problem in Westchester Square is the city of New York, okay? That's, that's it, that's it in a nutshell. It's the city of New York. And the reason it's the city of New York is because there's too much macroeconomic development going on in the city and not enough, and that's important, yeah. but there's not enough attention paid to the microeconomic issues. <laughs> SBS does a great job of that, okay? Traffic enforcement does a great job at that, and they're, against each other, okay? SBS is trying to uh, bring neighborhoods back and traffic blitzes are killing consumers from going into merchant strips. So that's always the biggest issue whenever we go someplace. <laughs> we had a, a, an issue one time, which is what he's alluding to, which is great, but um, it, was, it was a it's, calm. It was a calm, yeah. and uh, Bob's, not, he, Bob's not in this room, is he? 500 uh, of the closest okay. friends at a chamber okay. luncheon, but it was all right. No, it was, <laughs> and that was not planned, by the way, neither was this. But it's, it's the truth of the matter, and you know, I think that the biggest problem in New York City isn't that we don't have the right <laughs> people in place. That's not the problem. It's that we have too many of the right people not working together, okay? And, and I think that that's the problem. So my question is, what efforts do you all see, okay, as bringing together all these wonderful little forces of people who do a great job and making it one cohesive, well-planned operation. Westchester Square can be a gem. It needs coordination. It needs city coordination. And that's something that we've been barking about. And I would like to uh, know how you, uh, how you guys see that that could happen, not only in Westchester Square, but in other parts, particularly of the North Bronx, which has been um, uh, worked over for, for far too long. Thank you. I don't want anybody to know who I am. <laughs> well, I'm John Benizio. I'm the president of the Westchester Square Merchants Association and the chairman of the board of the Bronx Business Alliance. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.
Do you want to respond? Well, let him no, respond. I, 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 I could respond. I mean, I, you know, I share John's pain as someone who was in his, his job at, you know, when I headed up a local development corporation and business improvement district. And I tried. I mean, I, you know, there's, you know, when you talk about the parking and you pointed out, um, and the last time you met with the mayor, uh, he came back, he wrote on the back of a napkin. Do you, really, do you remember this? And he gave me a laundry list. He said, work with him. And, you know, and sometimes working with them means, you know, chipping away at the problems and taking, you know, big problems and breaking it down. And when you talk about, you know, the, the fact that there's a lot of, you know, city cars in Westchester Square that prevent you from parking or putting a bicycle rack in there or, you know, whatever it is, you end up looking at the layers of that. Now, you know, what I remember at Union Square, the hell it was to move the transit police parking out of that square where the green market is now. People remember that, remember right? That. And chipping away at that and saying, okay, you're moving one problem to another place, you know, come up with a solution. And I, and I, and I see you chipping away at it. You know, it's, it, is it gonna happen overnight? No, it's not gonna happen overnight. You brought to the attention on the park the fact that the capital project was delayed and it wasn't moving for a while. And sometimes you had to, you know, raise your hand and, you know, and get, get the mayor to come back with a napkin and give me and say what the hell is going on and work with Adrian Bannaby and move this thing and make things happen. It happens like that and that's why, quite frankly, we have groups like yours and Carrie's and DART and all the, you know, other things that take place. You know, so we can be, you know, so we can make, make uh, things aware. Uh, the location of social service is another, is another issue for you. And we just, we just, you know, what I would encourage, and I was walking around, you know, in, in the neighborhood where you teach. Yeah. You know, and a great example of that is what Tom Schutte has done, you know, outside of Pratt. Block by block, inch by inch, storefront by storefront, and trying to make, you know, something work. Is it going to happen overnight? No. Are we going to go away? No. We're going to, you know, continue working with you. Um, I don't fix parking tickets, um, uh, but we, we, we look to, you know, work with you every step of the way to, you know, make things better on, on a lot of different fronts. I, I think on a different level, the, um, the five borough chambers of commerce are, have done a good job of beginning to pull together. To, pulling together in the last year. And I think that's very important. And we had um, the partnership sponsored with the uh, Citizens Budget Commission, a summit on the 29th of September, where we had 80 different organizations from around the state trying to bring in the trade associations as well as the chambers of commerce, the ethnic chambers of commerce, to begin to bring business together to form a more cohesive force on policy and fiscal issues that are more than anything else affecting business in this city. So I do believe it's pulling together and I'll get your card to include in, in that consortium of groups that we're putting together. I wanted justice, I'll just pick it up. Um, my name is Bias Wilson, I'm a principal of Meridian Design Associates and uh, we're working with BronxNet, which is the Bronx's public access multimedia agency in developing their 12-year uh, plan for development. Um, one of the things that we recognize in that planning is that there's a vast network of existing uh, public sector, uh, knowledge industry, creative economy, and human services institutions which if they were energized with the right kind of telecommunications resources could serve their, their uh, you know, users better and could serve as local engines for economic activity. The same thing has been recognized by uh, President Obama in the broadband stimulus bill which uh, provides a lot of incentives for broadband stimulus projects to work with what are called anchor institutions. Uh, and so one of the things that BronxNet has identified is that it's looking to partner with anchor institutions to help them influence where the broadband resources flow in the Bronx because right now the Bronx is getting two brand new fiber optic nervous systems. They're like a public right away except there's no planning involved at all. And so it's like you're getting new highway systems but do you know where they're going? Does anyone here know where they're going? Does anyone know, know when you're going to get those resources? So um, BronxNet is looking to uh, work with groups, and there's obviously a lot of people here probably know BronxNet, to help to influence 
how that deployment goes so that rather than just hitting Throgs Neck and Riverdale, which was their original plan, um, that it goes to these anchor institutions and diffusely throughout the borough so that it can drive, help to drive economic development. That's a great, yeah. that is a really great yeah. comment and I've heard from others in the industry of the importance of that planning, so that's. There, there's, there's actually, it's, it's become one of my missions in life. The, 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 the telecommunication people talk like they live in, a, in their own universe and they're not talking to urban planners, architects, designers, cultural institutions, they, they, you know, it's like, you know, you'll come yeah. to us. We have I, to I, I think, I, you know, I think the advantage of this summit also is you have a number of people here. Um, one, you're gonna have the president of uh, EDC here later on, Seth Pinsky, great guy. He has staff here, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna single him out here, but, you know, this is an issue on his mind. I know it's on his mind in terms of bringing things like this together. Uh, and it, it's something that you should raise with him and his staff that are, that are here. Good, you're, you're getting together with him on the 8th. Okay, good. Hi, I'm Kathy Zamashansky. I'm uh, Executive Vice President of NAI Friedland Realty and the uh, Vice President of the Bronx Manhattan Association of Realtors Commercial Division. Um, my question and my concern is, in my daily work, I work with retailers and I'm constantly trying to bring them to the retail strips of the Bronx. We have a borough of neighborhoods and in the last 15 years, we've seen development of stores who come into our borough, but in the outskirts, called City Bay Plaza, Bronx Terminal Market, and now we're talking Kingsbridge Armory. So my concern and what I would like to see this panel think about is bringing incentives to commercial strips and to create kind of economic programs that you give developers to go into the Bronx Terminal Market, to go to 158th Street, to go to Bay Plaza. Bring it to the strips in the borough of the neighborhoods of our borough, because if we lose the strips on our neighborhoods, we're going to lose the neighborhoods. They are the backbone. I don't want to see the Bronx turn into Main Street in Iowa where Walmart went. And that's my concern with Kingsbridge Armory, because it could hold a Walmart. And then you'll destroy Fordham Road, which is the spine of the Bronx. So we need to think about, I know Kathy really thinks about these kind of things, how we can save our commercial strips, because they are the spine. Brooklyn is a perfect example. They focused on downtown Brooklyn. They paid attention to it. If it means you have to condemn some things, I know the landlords will hate me, but we have to condemn things sometimes to make things come back together. I can't find a site in Westchester Square for a major retailer, 10,000 square feet or more, because I don't have landlords who have space that will either consolidate it or work with me to make it happen. And that's a major problem. If I could put somebody like the gap in the square, that would make a difference. People would come to the square. You get the footprint, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, and, but they go, they're going to Bay Plaza. I, I, think, I think that's one of the things that the West And they didn't want to go to Bay Plaza in the beginning. They screamed, they carried on. Now it's one of the most successful places. And the Barnes & Noble, who didn't want to go there until Steve Kaufman made them go there, it's the most successful bonds and number they've got. Yeah. So that's just what I would like you to think about, how we can create some kind of program to help the local strips. Sure. Um, the question of, there's two levels of programs. One is the financial incentives that you provide to create a level playing field, which is what you're talking about. And I'll leave that to Bob. That's really a question of city policy. The second type is whether or not you do the problem solving from a land and parking and access point of view in order to create the opportunity, the physical opportunity for the businesses that go there. And there's wonderful examples. So for example, I helped a little bit uh, MBD, Mid Bronx Desperados with their shopping center, which uh, my role in that was convincing them to have a connection to the shopping street as opposed to having it all the way in the back with no pedestrian right. connection at all. That's so that's an example of, of how you can do it and do it right. In, ba in Hoboken, um, we took advantage of the president of the Ladies Mile, because they're vastly understored, to say that the larger footprint stores would go up above. The, down, the merchant, you could talk about this from 14th Street, it's in the merchant's interest to sell to all the spin-off stores. The anchor stores pay less per square foot. But if, the, if you allow retail on the second floor and you incentive, say only retail of a certain size so that it can afford the single entrance with the single escalator, then you can get those anchor stores on the second floor. One of the biggest problems for shopping, uh, now, Bronx car ownership is actually quite low exactly. compared to the rest. Like, there's actually one store like that on but, right now. But, um, but notwithstanding that, the, the national retailers 
and even regional retailers will insist on parking if for no other reason because they're looking at 13 different sites to open up right now and they're going to say one has parking, one doesn't. I'll come to the one that doesn't have parking later. And later is always later. So um, one at way to deal with parking is to look at what's called shared parking which is that a residential uh, building needs its parking mainly in the evenings on the weekends. Supermarket needs it mainly in the evenings and the weekends. But on the other hand, um, comparison uh, goods stores need it mainly on the weekend days as opposed to evening shopping. So you begin to think in terms of housing and comparison stores, uh, offices and retail, because their peaks are completely different. Commuter parking lots and retail, because their peaks are completely different. And from a sustainability point of view, by the way, that's the smartest thing to do, because otherwise you need two square feet of parking for every one square foot of retail. Did you have something you want to say, Joan? Um, just that there's, besides the, the city, you know, putting you know, maybe shifting the way it subsidizes retail development and the kinds of projects that it invests that subsidy money in. The other thing that could be invested is brain power. That the kind of thinking, I mean, there are some incredible planners at EDC, and there are incredible staff at New York City DOT, and to, to sort of bring that brain power to bear at the local level is a way that we could shift resources where like we don't have to find a big pile of new money. We just have to change the things that the city spends its time on. That's a good thing since there aren't very many of those big piles. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, good morning. My name is Leslie Messiah. I'm Assistant Vice President for Government Relations and State Affairs at Fordham University. So very nice to see you again, Ralph. Um, I guess the particular issue that we have is the fact that Colleges and universities, big cultural institutions like the Botanical Gardens, Bronx Zoos, are oftentimes confused with large businesses in terms of our goals, in terms of um, our economic planning and the like. And what we're seeing, and, and it is going to have an impact on small businesses, is the larger or the increasing number of unfunded mandates that are coming through, uh, through city policy, city planning, um, in particular the city council. For example, um, there's currently a bill that's on the agenda that's looking at the development of bicycle racks. Now that in itself sounds like a great idea, and we're not going to debate whether it is or it isn't. But the idea is now that you're telling institutions that you now have to place bicycle racks within a building center or within buildings or within garages, and we are a non-bike campus. Is some, those, those simple things that may sound like that might be beneficial for one particular county is not necessarily beneficial to another. And I guess my ultimate question is, what exactly is the relationship or can be the developed relationship between chambers of commerces, small business institutions, as well as not-for-profits in, in the monitoring of legislation that can be defined as unfunded mandates? Well, that, I think that's a really uh, interesting point, and uh, there are. Uh, are you, you're a SIG. Or no, you're no, you're not a SIG. You're a private university. The, I was thinking of the botanical garden is a, is a uh, city major, one of the major institutions. They have a council, but I, I guess the universities really don't have a shared lobbying entity as such. Do you? Statewide, we do. Um, nationally, the, we do. But in terms of New York not City, in the city. No, not, in the city. not at all. That's interesting. Do you have any thoughts on that, Katie? I think there's an opportunity there. Right. Speak in the microphone. <laughs> I'm Katie Schwab, and I work in the law offices of Claudia Wagner, and I would definitely agree. Hi, Leslie. Hey, We've spoken you? on the phone before. Um, that the Speak number, close to the mic. The number of unfunded mandates coming from the city council does seem to be increasing. And I think that there's definitely an opportunity. We work very effectively, I know, with the SIGs in our office. Um, and we're happy to talk more about it. Yeah, I, I, I think it probably makes sense for the not-for-profit institutions to have their, to make their own case. I don't know. John? Well, actually, I'll draw a connection between what several people are saying. And, you know, this is my, uh, my I guess, why I'm at Pratt. You know, it's, it's my Pratt prejudice is coming out. Um, you know, the whole thing about 
planning is it's best done as a partnership between the community and the city and the technicians that's when you get a really resonant plan that can be implemented so the, the good intentions of the city council because I think we can all recognize that there's good intentions there uh, needed a foil with the community in this case the community of colleges in the case of uh, someone before was alluding to the brilliance of the beam of the beam bloom I'm dyslexic Bloomberg administrations uh, plan NYC and general policies but then how do you realize it on the local basis and Jones point that that can, is as much about problem solving as it is about vision and being creative about problem solving. And so I think there's a theme here in terms of economic development from a grassroots uh, level, uh, making its way into policy as policy is realized on the local level. And sort of a cross acceptance is what it's called in planning jargon. Uh, it is something needed. And I would just remind everyone in terms of economic development that the, the urban legend is you get out of recessions due to small growth in small business. That every recession is actually a retooling of the economy which new small businesses discover how to handle and then expand. And so there really is a very strong message here in terms of, of your, the Bronx's participation in what is a, a national story. Hi, good morning. My name is Mark McCaskey and I'm from a moniker company called South Bronx Effects Works. Ms. Scott, you hit it on the nerve right there. I had to go up to Montreal and partner with a company called Samuel Hayne Productions to do film work. Uh, we're quite successful this year. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows that the Bronx until mid-late 60s had major production facilities. As a fact, if you watch Car 54, Where Are You? You'll see, it says proudly made in the Bronx with some moniker like Bronx 59 or something. Um, Naked City TV series, when it was filming in the Bronx, used that facility to film in the Bronx. To date, the last year that I have the stats for, the film industry in the five boroughs generated $6.3 billion. The Bronx got 10 million of that. That means Queens, Manhattan, and Brooklyn now get the bulk of that money. I, for the last couple of years, and I was talking to the borough president when he was an assemblyman, he thought it was a great idea. Why doesn't the Bronx have a film production facility? I know um, Silver Cup Studios, came and talked and they said, oh, we can't have it here because you got plane traffic. Um, Chelsea Pierce Studios, which I've done some work at, has a heliport right next to it. Soundproofing is a major key. Um, when they say that you can't film in the Bronx, or I should back up, I know last week they filmed two days of Mel Gibson filming on the concourse and it was like a big parade coming out. Um, didn't generate any money for the neighborhood because everybody on the crew, including the um, Chuck truck that came with it, came from Steiner Studios. Monday they were filming up, there's a studio called Lightbox in the old banknote building. They were doing a commercial on Monday. The Chuck truck, again, the um, caterer came from Steiner Studios. Uh, there's no caterers in the Bronx that anybody can use. And I see cameramen here working on, there's no people in the Bronx who could work for camera. Well, okay, but they can, I, I'm sure they would rather work on a film sometime in life. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is the Bronx has become the forgotten borough. When you call up the mayor's office for any type of help, it's always Queens, Brooklyn, or Manhattan. Um, I think the problem with the Bronx is, and Ms. Scott said, the arts have almost forgotten here, and I don't mean just design. I mean, there are filmmakers here. I've given special effects lectures at the... Um, uh, ghetto Film School, who now runs a film school. But when these kids graduate, where are they going? Right. Out of state, out of city. This year, the Senate cut the film tax incentive in half. You know how many productions left the city itself and how much money the boroughs lost? This year, if you <coughs> generate $2.5 in film work, I'll be amazed. You lost over 600 jobs in the film industry in the New York area alone. Soap operas left. Um, Fringe, which I worked on the last two episodes, are now filming proudly in Montreal and in upstate. I, I, I think it's great. We just did a movie in Buffalo and Montreal. I mean, and we're gearing up to do another film. Why is it that the Bronx does not have a film production center using Bronx electricians, Bronx caterers? Why is it that every borough is stealing this from us? And I've identified locations, and I'm willing to put my butt on the line now, and I will match dollar for dollar if somebody wants to speak to me to set up a real production facility. And I might add, we have a training program in CGI, which is computer-generated effects. And we trained five people two years ago. 
Those five people are now making, you talk about 15 and $20 an hour, they're making 50 to $65 an hour, and one guy just got a job at ILM, and they paid for his relocation. And the film industry in Montreal is booming, and it should be booming here instead of I, us losing it I and think, taking it there. I think you know, you've made a very good point. Do you want, did you yes. want to respond? Yes. Um, my firm designs uh, creative economy workplaces, television studios, film studios, et cetera. We've done studies for many of them in New York City, in Manhattan, and in, in, in uh, Harlem. Uh, when we go to talk to communities about economic development, where they used to say, can you make a Soho happen in our neighborhood, they all say, can you make a film studio happen in our neighborhood. Um, however, a lot of people uh, have a misinterpretation of how a film studio works in a district. The film studio itself is an attractor, but it does not... It's a loser. Just, it's a loser. Okay, it's all the other businesses. It's the caterers, it's the lighting, it's, it's, it's the people who work there that are the winners. So in order to attract a, a, a content creation facility to the Bronx, you need to create a district and, and you need to, and Steiner was heavily subsidized uh, and, and has its own stories that, uh, uh, okay, that is correct. So, it, so on the one hand, the creative economy is the future of the Bronx. BronxNet, for example, has trained thousands of people who work in the creative economy and have to leave the Bronx to do it. However, there would, it would need a unified planning process to identify where that place can be and to put together the district. For example, people choose to go to a film studio largely if there's offices that they can use. Every film studio every, that works has to have 10 to 20,000 square feet of office space. You can't just have the big open shed. There, there, right. There, there, if, if there's one other thing that's a huge problem, and that's one of the things I'm meeting with uh, Mr. Pinsky about. If you look in the zoning resolution, it doesn't describe the content creation workplace. Actually, in 30 years as a business, we have either had to change the zoning or scam the zoning in order to make most of our places work. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, to, to your point about land being available and to Bice's point, the, the, you're right on about the zoning. The New York City zoning was written in 1961 and it is poetic about Sorry. manufacturing processes that have not been used since probably Ooh, before wow. 1961. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I can't figure out where in that, you know, a, you know, a production facility fits. I can't even figure out what a copy shop is, is it? So. So I think the um, the point about the zoning needing to recognize not old kind of prescriptive use-based categories, but performance-based categories is right to the point, and that we could do that without kind of a grandiose overhaul of the zoning that isn't gonna occur in our lifetime. We could do that at a problem solving level and it would be an important way for the city to support space for the creative economy and for the blue collar and for the green collar economies because we don't know what the businesses are that are gonna be the drivers of the future. We pretty much know that they're not gonna be the ones of the past. Yeah, just to uh, try to sum up briefly some of what I'm hearing um, is this goes back to what we were saying earlier about creating accurate linkages and also revising and creating um, categories, systems such as zoning, but it goes beyond zoning. Um, things that match up with what is really happening on the ground. I want to meet a boot blacker. I mean, where, right. But when we go to apply to city services, there aren't a lot of relevant categories for us to check off in this matrix, and I don't, um, you know, I don't know why, but I think that all of us again have to come together, share the information, and ensure that um, the things um, that we do the deep drill down 
on the categories and the systems that are necessary to create this kind of healthy ecology that we're talking about. Okay, are, are you, question? Yes, good morning. Um, my name is Jeremy Sauter from the Hunts Point Economic Development Corporation. Uh, we service the Hunts Point Industrial Zone, um, more than 700 industrial manufacturing businesses um, with the support of the New York City Department of Small Business Services. And today um, I have uh, three observations to make. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to definitely acknowledge that um, as uh, Ms. Wild said, the, in, the importance of food industry clusters. Uh, Hunts Point is a food industry uh, cluster. Um, t more than 10,000 workers are employed, um, more than th about 300 industrial businesses servicing the food industry. The, the Hunts Point produce terminal market, the meat market, the fish market, uh, are together uh, considered the largest food distribution center in the U.S. Um, as such, we are passionate advocate of this industry and especially of the project to uh, renovate uh, the, and expand the Hunts Point uh, produce terminal market. So we, we are um, strong advocates for city uh, involvement and, and state and federal involvement in in producing the incentives to assist in the, in the financing of this project, which is uh, uh, going to touch uh, more than 8,500 workers citywide and thousands of uh, restaurants um, and supermarkets in New York we City. We have a couple more questions. Sure. Um, so first, my observation on this. Um, second, on, in terms of the um, sector-based workforce, as Mr. Walsh uh, said, we definitely are a proponent of, uh, of this approach, especially in, the, in, uh, in terms of CDL drivers in Hans Point. There's a need for qualified drivers, so we would most welcome working with the New York City Small Business Services on this. And third, in terms of transportation of workers, as uh, Ms. Byron said, it is definitely needed. There is a shuttle service in Hans Point that provides access to more than 500 workers. They were, if, if not for this service, it would be extremely difficult to reach many parts of the industrial park. And we would like to uh, encourage permanent funding for this uh, project, which is right now under temporary funding from the federal government. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. Hi. 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 I'm Mary Healy from Bronx Community College, and I'd just like to ask the panel um, to give their thoughts about the borough president's dream of having a hotel in the Bronx. Is, is that something we can hope for or that we want to hope for? Uh, I know that at our colleges we were always dreaming about having wonderful um, academic conferences if we had a place to put people. So I'd just like to ask the, um, the panel their thoughts on the hotel idea. John? Yeah, sure. It's eminently doable. Uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, the first Disneyland was not eminently doable. There was, you know, whoever heard of a theme amusement park based on a comic strip character? You know, huh? Disney World, Disney World Paris, et cetera, was eminently doable because the president was there. So the Marriott Brooklyn uh, is a guaranteed flow of, of customers from, for its rooms from the courthouse. It has a um, a wonderful position in terms of being the catering hall of choice for high school graduates and others, and picks up business. It was subsidized, but as we were talking about, a significant amount of the first in type of business is also subsidized. And it, it would seem to make a lot of sense. Again, the question of location comes to mind. So for example, something near the courthouse and Yankee Stadium for imaging probably would make some sense. What about here? We got four banker institutions. Ron, well, you, you were going to say something about Brooklyn. No, I, I, you know, when when the when when the borough president brought that up, I was thinking about downtown Brooklyn. You know, ten years ago, there was how many hotels in downtown Brooklyn? St. George. St. George. Okay, okay. St. George, but that didn't that convert into Which a residential? Which wasn't a hotel. It, was an it converted SRO. into a residential, right? But but you know, and I was thinking about that point when he men mentioned it, and then I think about what's taking place here with the four institutions coming together, like they have 
and the needs of, can you imagine on a daily basis, the Botanical Gardens, the Zoological Society, Montefiore Hospital, and Fordham? And why is it, you know, makes sense? And it, some, of, some of that probably has to do with zoning. Yeah, the, the, and getting a, you know. Yeah. This, is, also, this is not yeah. the propitious yeah. moment to be trying yeah. to finance a hotel construction, I should say. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold my breath. Um, but I do think in terms of looking at the, hopefully, a long-term economic cycle, uh, the, that it is a time to start planning for one. And it, actually, um, I, what I was alluding to was the Marriott Hotel in downtown Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. But the, the thing that you have to do, and I think I would bring this back to it's your point, Kathy, which is um, econo how long, I worked on the Kingsbridge Armory 15 years ago for Landmarks Conservancy, 20 years ago for Landmarks Conservancy, identifying that it, it, it's 500,000 square feet could be used for a supermarket, for a track running center, for the head house of school, and you'd still have 300,000 square feet left over. So, you know, it's now taken 15 years, and, and you know, lots and we'll of other good studies. And it'll probably take 15 more. And it'll probably take 15 more. So the time to start working on the hotel in terms of the borough president's vision is now, because the planning will take, will be done just in time for when we come out of the recession. The this was one of the tricks of Robert Moses. Whenever a, um, a, uh, a legislator or an elected official wanted a ribbon cutting, within two years, he already had the plans done. So when the money flowed, he was ready. And we can do that too now. Next question. Um, Michaela Cray with Sustainable South Bronx. I wanted, yeah, sure. One of the things that I find really exciting right now is that, you know, without a plan in 2030, there's, um, you know, there's some issues and lack of the discussion of jobs, but most recently the mayor has announced some additional initiatives following up on Plan y, uh, YC in terms of how to really engage the business sector, um, clean tech, as well as other jobs. And one thing I'm really proud of in the Bronx, aside from running this organization, is the fact there is a number of green developments, affordable housing, there's a number of um, recent projects the city has um, been part of that are green, and we have uh, amazing businesses between a company that produces bamboo flooring, another company that does pork <laughs> flooring, um, another company that um, has created a cooperative. So I'm curious in terms of um, looking back to the retail side of things. Yeah. I've heard recently um, at uh, the nation's largest green building council network last week about some initiatives for, for main streets and how they've used um, greening initiatives for local mom and pop stores as a way to improve their bottom line and also as a form of marketing. And I was curious if you had any thoughts about that from the SBS side in terms of something that you guys are thinking of in terms of helping small businesses improve their energy efficiency and save their dollars, but also as a way to market and draw people in. Did you read the column this morning, I hadn't heard it before, about cash for culkers as the next federal jobs program? <laughs> cash for culkers, you know, culk, insulation, and, uh, as opposed to cash, cash for clunkers, gun, which yeah. is the, new, the, the concept being to, as a job, they're looking for job stimulus programs that the federal government should provide some kind of a similar rebate to people that invest in weatherizing their homes. Uh, we might add to that, per your point, uh, merchants and storefronts that agreed to invest in weatherization, which could, uh, and other green energy activities. And, and it sounds to me like, um, like it's something that may go forward. So I, I'd say that might be something to focus yeah. on. I don't know if it, anybody yeah. wants to add yeah. anything quickly. I would, I would add quick that, that, that federal pipeline may be there. There are existing programs from NYSERDA, from Con Edison, and the difficulty that small businesses have is navigating those. So. We do some technical assistance on that in the nonprofit mode. It would be really interesting for small business services to make that a major effort, not to create new programs, but to, to make, it, make the existing resources intelligible to the businesses that need them. Yeah. Also, also tabulating the companies like the ones you mentioned and getting them as part of a city's promotion for buying local producers of green products because we haven't we tried a couple months ago for a press article on green energy to get a list of the companies in the city or an inventory of the companies and we couldn't get one there there wasn't yeah. a I would suggest list. there's a guy in my office by the name of Chris Neal who wakes up every morning thinking about this I'm still trying to wrap my uh, head around this whole issue of green jobs what are they where are they when when are they going to be here uh, Chris does this. He's in the process of opening up a manufacturing industrial sector to, you know, to tap into you know, jobs. But I, I, I think it would be helpful for him 
and perhaps for you, you know, to just get together. He's a, he's a great guy, has a fantastic staff, and himself, Megan O'Meara, and a number of other people. Megan Burke is right behind you. She could give you all the information, you know, uh, to get in touch with uh, Chris, and I think, I think that would be helpful. I think you have a lot of good ideas there. We could be. I think it's been alluded to earlier that we don't do a good job in this city of targeted local procurement. And mm. this is one example where we ought to be far more focused in that direction. Is there, are some of you asking questions or are you just standing there? Actually, if I could step in just for Go a sec ahead. on this question of how it relates to the retail districts. And by the way, that's Michaela Crater, who is a Pratt graduate, but also the executive director of Sustainable South Bronx. Well, there you go. So, um, look, uh, and I think, Bob, you captured it. Mm -hmm. Everyone over 50 has a hard time wrapping their head, hands around this whole sustainability thing because we grew up with our cartoons where Boris and Natasha and the uh, body snatchers and other stand-ins for the Cold War. And the next generation grew up with um, uh, teenage ninja turtles fighting pollution. And they, and they generally get it. They generally realize that sustainability is the challenge of this generation the way the Vietnam War and the power structure was the challenge of my generation. And, um, on a purely cynical basis, for those of us who are over 50 and own businesses or are supporting business districts, that's a market. It's no accident that, ex, that so many oil companies now brand themselves with green, with a little flower. You know, BP led the way. Um, and so, uh, you know, from uh, British Petroleum to what is it? Uh, uh, you know, it's post, what is it called again now? Beyond. Beyond Petroleum. Okay. okay. So how can you capitalize on that? One is simply in your marketing, just as business corporations do it. But there's some other creative ways. For example, in some towns, they find that the recycling center is actually the major social gathering spot. All that little film we saw about the kids coming to the botanical garden, we all got very excited. Well, that was maybe 30 or 80 kids a week. That's not a thing of substance. So, so green has become, like art and sports, a high visibility small business. And in that sense, can help to re-image your shopping district, which up until now is looking a little tired. That's a good idea. Um, a building on that, uh, branding is another key. And that's really bringing um, some of the specifics into play about what is key, not only about, um, you know, certainly green business, green jobs, et cetera, since this is one of the topics, but also in terms of being able to develop niche markets. Uh, one example from uh, what we're doing at the Bronx Council is that we're creating a guidebook for the creative industries. It's um, a nascent project right now, and we're still working on getting it off the ground, but it is on our website, bronxarts.org. And um, it's called, well, I call it the CB3. It's the Creative Bronx Black Book. And it's a vetted directory of creative services um, that are here in the Bronx. And so it's live, it's online, it's getting thicker. So if you're a creative um, industry or service person or business, please um, let us know and sign up on there. What it is available virtually as well as um, being able to be printed out in PDF. And our staff personally visits and interviews each of the businesses so that um, we can host, um, as part of this directory, folks that we know that are um, dealing ethically and that we know are gonna be there for a minute. Access those types of things. It's called, um, our website is uh, bronxarts.org. You can also Google us, Bronx Council on the Arts. And the name of the publication is the Creative Bronx Black Book, and it's a vetted directory of creative services. So we're trying to get there. We have time for one more question. Hi, everyone. My name is Fernando Toronto. I'm the district manager for Community Board 7, which is uh, just around here. And um, the community board recently worked on a proposal to uh, rezone Webster Avenue. And one of the things that we hear with, uh, with rezoning is that it only changes the usage. It doesn't uh, bring the demand or the types of businesses that you want. And we're trying to rezone Webster Avenue so that potentially we could have uh, professional office space, potentially a hotel, potentially uh, these larger commercial uh, districts on East Gun Hill Road, on, uh, on the intersection of Fordham Road, on the intersection of Bedford Park Boulevard. So my question is, how do we diversify our workforce here, which is retail, you know, which are pr primarily work in the retail or, or tourism industry, uh, how do we d diversify our workforce by giving incentives to other corporations to want to locate here to the Bronx? You have 
access points to Manhattan. You can get to Manhattan within less than 20 minutes via the 18, Metro North. 18 minutes, exactly. Um, I know it. Got it down. Uh, so, uh, and, and you have all this tourism. You have Botanical Gardens, Fordham University, Lehman Center for Performing Arts, uh, access to uh, highways uh, to go to Westchester and, and points north. Um, we have all these assets, and nobody seems to take advantage of them. Another one is the um, the mayor's plan for using the waterways for ferry service. Well, we have the Fordham Landing, where potentially you could develop a, a ferry service that could get to both sides of Manhattan in 20 minutes. Uh, you could use that same ferry to go to Jersey, to Yonkers, to LaGuardia Airport, and here it is. Here's this potential, and nobody's looking at it. So. How do we get the city to look at it? Yeah, I, I think it's being looked at. And, you know, I, I'm waiting for Dart to like pop out of his chair uh, because it was uh, Dart that led a group of uh, city officials not too long ago walking up Webster Avenue and seeing some of the things that are not taking place. And you're right. I used to live on Decatur off 196 as a grad student. Okay? Um, you know, I know the area. I know what you're talking about. I know the, you know, the, 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 uh, the shops that you do have, uh, you know, uh, you know, from or lack of, you know, from Fordham Road on up to uh, Marshall Parkway, um, and you know, it's my understanding that uh, you know the Bronx uh, uh, Office of City Planning had been look, looking at it. I don't know where it is queued up. I'm happy to you know take a look at it again. You know, but but there's something much more important than that, and the much more important is is the work that you've been doing with uh, is it Cooper Carey that the work the the, the uh, four uh, institutions. Cooper Robertson, of coming to, have you seen that report that they've come out with? You know, which talks about, you know, the tentacles off these major institutions. And I think there's so much potential power if you add up not only the brain power, the creativity, the number of jobs, the types of jobs of the four institutions, the fact that they're working together. You know, Allerton Avenue, right, on the, on the other side. And, you know, and what all these, in terms of looking out, and it's you know the first time in, in my lifetime, in decades that I that you know that I've seen you know the institutions coming together. Is it happening as fast as we want? No, you know. But the good thing that I see is that you're starting to see some investment outside the respective campuses of those four four institutions. But how do we bring new businesses? Yeah, let me. I think, let I, think me try I think it starts with zoning. And I and I uh, what I would say is. We, you and I should talk, you know, afterwards and see where it is queued up on Webster Avenue because I, I know there's, there's been some discussion. One word, procurement by those four institutions. There are the jobs that they directly create and there are the retailers that, you know, that sell sandwiches to those employees. But the supply chains of all those institutions have been incredible generators of economic activity in places like Cleveland. So are we, do, are, do, are we as smart as Cleveland? Joan, I think, I, I think though, the question, the question that he's asking is, um, is an important one. And we've spent much of this conversation talking about community revitalization, economic development. We've spent very little of it talking about the diversification of the Bronx economy and tying the Bronx into global growth patterns. And I hope in the rest of the day you'll have that opportunity. In speaking to some of the, I mean, and that was why I mentioned in the beginning the fact that the insurance industry jobs was the big, uh, increased by over 2,000 in the last year in the Bronx, and that was kind of an interesting phenomenon. I talked to uh, the head of uh, Deutsche Bank yesterday and he told me, he was talking about a phenomenon that I've heard more and more of, backsourcing, bringing bags, jo jobs back from India to the United States, technical centers, not only because the arbitrage and cost is less today with India, but because control factors, compliance factors, even time factors, uh, time zone factors, have become increasingly important to business. And he said they've just brought 1,000 jobs back and are creating a great new technology center in Raleigh-Durham. Um, those are jobs that yeah. we have to figure out how to compete for in the five boroughs. And they're jobs that are often very appropriate for boroughs that have universities, that have kids that are being trained in technology and computer science that can move right into them. So it's a way of diversifying both the workforce and the workplace. And I think I'm glad you ended on that note because I think we get so absorbed in our neighborhood that we sometimes forget that we've got a contribution to make on a larger plane. So.